Okay, I want to do tonight's lesson on the topic of cultural captivity and Christianity. What is that? Well, I'm getting the idea from Ruben Rivera, and what he says essentially is that Christianity should be relevant to the culture, but should never be held captive by the culture. Okay, he's trying to get that balance. Now, Ruben Rivera is PhD and professor of Christian history and chief diversity officer at Bethel University in Minnesota. Okay. And he taught a over hour long seminar titled Christ ever culturally relevant, never culturally captive, freeing Christianity from bias and cultural captivity. So that's his goal. Now I want to give you a little bit of the perspective that he's coming from. Okay. This seminar will intru will introduce participants to the surprising ways that even socially conscious Christians can be hindered by unconscious cultural captivity in group influences and contrast this with what Rivera calls remarkable Christianity. He is a chief diversity officer. Okay. So obviously he's coming from a particular perspective and there's a reason I wanted to engage with his work. Right now, there's a lot of discussion online between progressive Christianity and conservative contemporary Christians. And I don't know if you also know about all of this woke gospel infighting that's going on within certain denominations. Okay. I regularly listen to people who are warning against woke gospel people. I listen to Vody Bauckham. I listen to James White. I listen to John Harris. I listen to A.D. Robles. Okay. And so I get a little bit of their influence. But here, Ruben Rivera is coming at this issue from a slightly different perspective. And woe be it to me if I surround myself in an echo chamber and only listen to those people that I'm familiar with. Okay. So I wanted to jump into Ruben Rivera's material, chief diversity officer, and he calls himself a socially conscious Christian. Let's see what he has to say. I thought his talk was very good, and he had many, many good points. I'm going to try to summarize it, and then just give some of my ideas and thoughts. Here's what he essentially says. This is where Ruben Rivera starts. He says, we have a problem as Christians where we are trying to take the one way of Christ and have it to impact the cultural manyness of the nations. The Great Commission, right? Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, you know, and you're going to do that to the ends of the earth. Okay. Well, in the process of doing that, we have Christ, the one way of salvation, and he is going into the cultural manyness of the world. So we just inherently have an issue that we have to deal with. How does the one way meet cultural manyness? What Rivera says is we have a problem, and our problem is that we are inescapably embodied. What that means is you have a particular context in which you believe certain things. Wherever you're born in the world has a massive impact on the beliefs that you have. Has anyone ever told you that the only reason you're a Christian is because you live in America and if you had been born in India, you would be Hindu instead? That's the idea, right? And because we are born in certain areas, we have a confirmation bias that tends to keep us stuck in these modes. You're raised in a certain context, society, and culture, and so you're basically stuck because you are inescapably embodied by a human being. This is what Rivera is calling cultural captivity, okay? This is what's making you culturally captive. You're captive to your culture. And he has a formula for this. He says, Christ plus you equals diversity of Christian expressions, okay? Christ is the one way... You is the culturally captive person, and whenever you combine those two, you are bound to get a diversity of Christian expressions. This you here is your experience, your family, your genes, your culture, your context, okay? Because these two come together, you are always bound to get a diversity of human expressions. Now, for Rivera, salvation doesn't change this. Christians are still just as biased as when they were non-Christians. Salvation doesn't stop you from being captive to your cultural influences. And what he uses to try and prove this is the example of Peter. Okay, Peter, in Matthew 16, 17, receives a revelation from God and speaks truth here. Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This bypassed Peter's cultural bias, and God revealed something directly to him. But Peter, 
just verses later in verse 23 says something wrong to Jesus and tries to stop Jesus from going to the cross. And Jesus says, but he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance for me for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. What is Ruben Rivera's point? He says, Peter was culturally captive at this point. Even though he's already Christian, even though he's already believed in Jesus, here Peter demonstrates his cultural captivity. What was his cultural captivity? Well, the Jews expected that the Messiah was going to come and deliver them from the hands of the Romans and basically kick the Romans out and set up God's kingdom here on earth. And so that's his example. I think this is actually a decent example, right? So on the one hand, he could be right, but on the other hand, he could also be wrong in a fairly profound way, okay? So now here's the question then. All right, you've identified that we as Christians are still subject to cultural captivity, right? At times. What's to be done about this? Well, Ruben Rivera's answer is called remarkable Christianity. That's what he calls it. Remarkable Christianity. And what he says with remarkable Christianity is that your salvation has impact on both vertical and horizontal dimensions. On vertical dimensions with your relationship with God. On horizontal dimensions with your relationship with others. And what he says is that we often try to identify ourselves in terms of our relationship with God. That's our Christianity after all. In fact, how many times have you heard Christians say something like, we're... Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. His point is that we're talking about our relationship with God, and that's how we want to identify our Christianity. But he says there's a problem with this. And the problem is, nobody can see your relationship with God. Your relationship with God is an entirely vertical and invisible dimension. He says, what can people see about you as a Christian? They can see your horizontal dimension. They can see your relationship with other people. That's all of your faith that the world can see. And so, we as Christians need to emphasize the vertical and horizontal dimensions of Christian discipleship. That's what he says. He says, in order to do this, we need to differentiate between our ideals and our reality. Sometimes we have really good ideas, but we don't really manifest them in reality. Instead, if we'll focus on the horizontal dimension and understand the reality of our situation, then perhaps we can demonstrate a salvation that's truly been instantiated in our lives. Okay? So that's his point. Now he said one final thing, and I thought this was very interesting, and it's probably the thing in the video I take most issue with. He said, when the gospel comes to a community, who changes? Okay? So you bring the gospel into a community, who changes? And he tries to give the example of Christians converting Indians, Native Americans, Mesoamericans, etc. And what he says is you essentially had this approach of trying to strip them entirely of all of who they are, their culture, everything, and we essentially tried to make them into Westerner Christians. That's what he says. He says, when the gospel comes to a people, we are the ones who need to do the changing, not them. That's what he said in his talk, okay? And he took a quote from Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor said this, Our job is not to nationalize the Chinese people. It's to make them Christian. And when we're done, they'll be Christian and Chinese. Okay? And that's where he puts the emphasis. We need to change and adapt to their new culture and their new situation. Okay? Now, what are my thoughts on this? First of all, I thought it was a really good talk. Honestly. I liked what he had to say. And I thought it brought a good counter perspective to some of what's going on right now. He's trying to remain balanced here, which I can really appreciate, okay? He didn't throw the Bible out the window or anything like that. He's trying to remain balanced. Now, he did talk about culture and how you're instantiated in your culture and you're kind of stuck there, right? And he kind of presented this all as a negative, but I think there's a positive element to this as well. This is Paul when he's preaching and he's noting the sovereignty of God in people living in the nations they're in. Listen. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. And so, I think the cultures aren't entirely good and they're not entirely evil. 
okay? And I think God was sovereign in how those cultures were instantiated. Ruben Rivera, at some points, kind of diminishes our culture and says, we don't need to be pushing our culture on everybody else. We need to help them to maintain their own culture. And while I think that's true to a part, I also think it's a bit reductionistic. This is not an either or, but a both and, okay? And I want to illustrate this with just a little picture here. Here you have church and culture, and notice how they're feeding into each other, okay? Now, a lot of people might think that this is a vicious circle, that you either take one paradigm or the other, and they just feed into each other this way. Because after all, your culture is going to interpret how you understand and do church, and how you understand and do church is going to interpret your culture. And so we have a vicious circle here, and you just have to pick one and jump in at some point. But I don't think that's the case. This reminds me of a hermeneutical spiral, okay? If you want to learn more about the hermeneutical spiral, get Grant Osborne's book, okay? The hermeneutical spiral looks like this, okay? What it is, is this is not a vicious circle, but instead it's a spiral. And we spiral in, narrowing ever and ever closer to the truth. Again, this isn't an either or, it's a both and. There are aspects of the culture that should remain, but there are also aspects of the culture that should change and be sanctified. Similarly, there are aspects of the church that is feeding in that should remain, and there are aspects of the church that should change in response to the culture it's encountering and be sanctified. In this way, we get ever and ever closer to the true sanctified aspect of the gospel impacting a specific culture or society, okay? Now, there's a context in which I want to bring this up, and this has to do with John Verveke's concepts of reciprocal broadening versus reciprocal narrowing. If you do the spiral the white, right way, okay, find the best aspects of the church, find the best aspects of the culture, and utilize them to get closer and closer to the sanctified truth, then... You have a reciprocal broadening in his language to get ever and ever closer to the sanctified truth, okay? However, if you emphasize the worst in each, the worst aspects of the culture are informing the church, then the worst aspects of the church informing the culture, you have a reciprocal narrowing, okay? Moving you further and further away from the truth. And this is the same behavior pattern that addicts undergo. An addict is actually undergoing reciprocal narrowing. And I know it looks backwards here, but that's how the idea is properly conceived of. You're a narrowing your options because you're moving further and further away from the sanctified truth. The reciprocal narrowing causes you to get stuck in that negative, addictive cycle and pattern of behavior. Okay. And this is what happens if you don't get this balance right. And so I think this is a both and not an either or. When it comes to Ruben Rivera's work, I think the problem arises in the specifics, okay? He brings up, we shouldn't try to change them. You know, we should just try to bring the gospel and in the end, they're going to be Christian and Chinese. True, but what aspects of Chinese culture need to be adjusted to the gospel and what aspects of Chinese culture are good, holy, righteous, and good and don't need to be adjusted at all by biblical norms or standards? That's where the rubber meets the road. And I think that's where Ruben Rivera's problem meets its hangups. Which parts are Bible and good and needs to be instituted, and which parts are cultural and need to be retained based upon the impact of the gospel in that context? That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where problems arise in determining the specifics. All of that said, I think Ruben Rivera's model is a good start. I think it's a good start. He's trying to emphasize the both and, not the either or. I think it can set us on the right path, but I think more work needs to be done regarding the topic. Okay? So, good discussion, honestly. And again, Ruben Rivera coming from a perspective that I don't constantly listen to or anything like that, and I thought he had some fantastic things to say. Okay? Good start. More work needs to be done, but those are my ideas on that concept.